wanted to tell me something. Yes, I think that the challenges that we will face in government are really quite profound in the sense that um, when I look at my grandson uh, who is less than a year old I recognize that all the most profound issues that will face him in life economy environment security terrorism health the whole range of issues that will face him let alone his children in life are now globalized and this is the fundamental reality that it's no longer to a possible convincingly for government to approach these issues in a watertight context of the nation state. They all have to be tackled effectively on an international basis. And therefore, I think one of the challenges to the new Labour government will be not simply saying, well, here is our strategy, our, our radical strategy in the interests of the nation as a whole as distinct from the radical right politics which are just in the interest of the successful. The concept that there will be success for the few and that this will trickle down and benefit society as a whole, which is totally failed. I mean, it is totally disgraced as a concept. Growing differentials in wealth and all the rest. There will be this new radical commitment to the concept of responsibility to society as a whole, society providing the basis for all individuals to succeed, something in which Tony passionately believes. But of course, on the things that matter most, the solutions will not be found just within the context of the United Kingdom. They will have to be tackled within the context of Europe working together. They will also not be found in Europe alone because they will have to be found in the context of Europe working together in the international community as a whole. And what I think is very interesting, therefore, in, in, in the approach is that uh, Tony is obviously a very powerful, almost a presidential candidate standing in his own right. But he has got some very important lieutenants upon whom he will be, of course, very dependent. Uh, there's Gordon Brown, who has this sense of the international reality of economics, and that is terrific. And there is Robin Cook, who has this real sense of how these issues, as I've just listed them, have to be tackled internationally. And it's not a matter of just doing what you want to do in Britain and then doing a bit of international cooperation. It's a matter of seeing that the whole process of government is your involvement in the international community as a whole. Now, those will be challenges which we have to face up to. And I think that that will be an important uh, priority for the new government because I said that these are, there's a new generation of politicians coming in. The older generation of politicians had been used to working with people in the international global setting. They will have to build these relationships and therefore their relationships and the support they get and the dialogue and the communication they have with other leaders around the world will be tremendously important in getting all that right. The other thing which is not unrelated to this is that uh, there is the question as to whether um, this is an evolution or a revolution, of course. And I was arguing that there's been this very strong leadership, almost evangelical leadership by Tony in terms of his destiny and the destiny for Britain. And he has asked the party and the movement for a great deal of support in terms of trust. And this has been given. I cannot remember in 45 years membership of the party, I cannot remember a time 
when the party so broadly was saying we've got to win, we've got to support Tony in winning, we've got to work with Tony in winning, we must put on one side, as I was saying earlier, this intellectual self-indulgence and so on, of argument and the rest, we must back him. But that's taken a lot of trust, a lot of goodwill. Now, of course, as we get into government, the going will get rough. It will get rough very quickly. And we will come into very challenging and demanding times. And at that time, friends become tremendously important. And constituencies of support become tremendously important. And the different corporate elements that are there in society take on a new significance because the, the checks and balances and the reality of society it is they all have a part to play and so on. And therefore the government will have, it seems to me, to work increasingly in terms of building up this constituency of people who feel they are sharing in the policies, the development of the policies and so on, and have a, have a real part to play in the formulation of the priorities. That is something at which the government will have to work very hard. And I think that, uh, again, the people around Tony will have a tremendously important part to play in all that. People of Sedgefield? People of? Sedgefield. The people of Sedgefield. Sorry, I didn't get the last The people of Sedgefield. Sedgefield, his constituency. His constituency. Oh, his constituency. Yeah. Uh, yeah, people in his constituency. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so I didn't get what you said. Uh, no, I think, uh, um, yes. Certainly them, but I am also talking about the people of society as a whole. I'm talking about uh, the party and beyond the party. I'm talking about the professional organisations, which are very important in Britain now. I'm talking about civil society, which has become much stronger than it used to be in terms of the non-governmental agencies, which are a tremendously important part of Britain now. I'm talking about the industrial associations, I'm talking about the trade unions and so on, of course I'm talking about them. They will have a vital part to play in sustaining the government and therefore relationships with them will become very important. What can Europe learn from new Labour and new Britain? What do I... What can Europe learn, can learn from the new Labour and new Britain? Well, I look at my own youngsters who are now in their 20s and they feel European. I mean, this is just a reality. They feel European. Uh, I think what's going to happen is that there will be a growing sense of a recognition. It, it's, it's just is there. There will be a growing recognition by people that they are part of Europe and they feel part of Europe. But insofar as they have a more local identity, and we all look for security in some local identity, I think that uh, we will see the growing importance of being Scottish or English or Welsh within Europe. And I think that will be a trend. And my own view is that the uh, wisdom of the party and the wisdom of the leadership of the party here has been very important because The Conservatives, of course, have liked to say that this is the breakup, the potential breakup of the United Kingdom by playing this card. I think it's quite the reverse. I think if you try to keep artificially, prolong artificially, uh, a concept which doesn't meet the, the aspirations and the, the sensitivities and the feelings of the people, that becomes very dangerous. It becomes actually very dangerous in the long run. And I think, therefore, the wisdom of the party in moving ahead of that and trying to get ahead of that and saying, no, we must meet the aspirations of the Scottish people, of the Welsh people, of the Irish people for their identity is tremendously important. Um, and that is how we will hold in a new sort of, uh, perhaps almost in our own United Kingdom, kind of uh, uh, increasingly sort of federal way, the United Kingdom together. Uh, But it's going to be a very interesting experiment because I'm quite sure that being half Scottish myself and very close to my Scottish family, I know how deep this is in Scotland and I think Scots see themselves as Scottish in Europe. It's perhaps not quite as strong in Wales but it's there in Wales too 
um, and so on. And it would be interesting to see how this relationship between Scotland, Wales, England, the United Kingdom, and Scotland, Wales, England, and Europe works out in the future. And of course, Ireland remains a very big challenge. You have seen a lot of many politicians in your life. You have seen many ministers, many prime ministers, and most of the politicians, some of them, they like to go back to their constituency. Is it a place where they can find their strength for the future? Well, I think you can only honestly talk about these things in terms of your own personal experience. And to me, my constituency was terribly important. Uh, it was the place where I felt I was identifiably accountable to a real community. And I always felt that when I was working very hard on the things that I felt to be important in terms of our international relations, because my ministerial posts were all to do with external affairs. I had to work doubly hard to demonstrate my commitment to my constituents, and that seemed to me to be right, that it was a tension that was important. People used to ask me when I was out of Parliament what I missed in politics. And I said I missed the constituency desperately, this, this sense of having a community to which you really belonged, in which you were a part. Very important. I missed, if I'm very candid, I missed the stimulus of office. It, I enjoyed the stimulus of office. I wasn't one of those people who ever um, found that Parliament in itself became the primary attraction. Parliament to me was always the place you went to do a job as the representative of your constituency, as a minister, whatever, you came into Parliament. But I've always been a bit suspicious of this, this club of Parliament as an end in itself. It's a place you go to do the things that are necessary. I think the constituency is terribly important in, in politics. Uh, and, you know, in this rather eccentric uh, role that we all play in, the House of Lords, albeit a reformed House of Lords, we're going to have a reformed House of Lords, we must have a reformed yes. House of Lords. But in this rather eccentric existence we have, I miss that. And I think that uh, in a second chamber it's, it's a weakness that we don't actually have identifiable communities to which we're accountable. We're, we can become very remote from, from, from basic reality. Uh, it was very... You, here with the people of his constituency. Do you think he can find another way of thinking in his constituency, another word, another personality, another politic, another human? I think Tony is... It's very lonely being a leader, you know. And particularly, if I'm allowed to say so, in the age of the media, uh, you're under a great deal of scrutiny. I think that his... Uh, constituency and his relationship to his people in the constituency will matter tremendously to him too. It's a, it's a very important part of the British political culture and uh, I, uh, I know, well for example, that he has been, you know, it's not just theory, this business, look how the Labour Party membership has been being built up. He was doing that in his own constituency, he takes this seriously. So I don't think there's a division in personality, it's not two personalities, it's, it's part of it. But it's, it's a recognition that when you're there dealing with the affairs of state or whatever, you've always got at the back of your mind um, the realisation that it isn't just that there is the nation out there, but there's a real community of which you're a part of. And you've got to stand up in front of them and be re-elected. And that's a very important discipline in politics. I think it's something very rich. Now, I'm in favour, of course I'm in favour, of a revision of our uh, many aspects of our constitutional arrest. But I don't want us ever to lose the constituency base. Because I think once you do that, the whole quality of our democracy will suffer very much indeed. You know, I can remember when I was Minister of State of the Foreign Office on one occasion, uh, there was a quite important uh, minister coming from a uh, 
quite important country to visitors. And I suddenly realized that the arrangements had been made for this minister to arrive in London at the weekend, although our meetings were not going, in fact, to start until the Monday. And officials were saying to me, um, Minister, it's very important that you are at the airport to meet him. And I said, I'm sorry, I have a long-standing engagement of some importance in my constituency with some of my constituents at the time at which he's arriving. And I remember some of my officials saying, oh, but come on, minister, I mean, that's your constituency. This is I said, the only basis that I, on which I have any authority for being in Parliament, and therefore the only basis which I have the authority for being a minister from Parliament, is that I was elected by the people of my constituency. My contract with the people of my constituency is what is at the base of basis of my whole credibility and effectiveness and, 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 and being as a minister, let alone a member of parliament and so on. And I must fulfill this obligation to the people in my constituency. And you will just have to explain, if need be, to the visiting minister that there's no offence, but that it's that contract with the people that gives me my authority to do anything. And I think that is something that we have to work at, because we all know that there is a, a bit of a crisis, well not a bit, a quite major crisis of uh, confidence in politi the political system generally throughout the world, and uh, there's a lot of questioning of politicians and so on. And, and part of that is, uh, I think, a perceived professionalism of the wrong kind amongst politicians in which they rather arrogantly see themselves as as the politicians and we have to work at building that direct relationship with the people to whom they're accountable not just a theoretical constitutional reality not just something that happens at the general election once every three four five years but but as something which is real and living and i think tony does take that seriously and I think most of his colleagues take it seriously. Well, you take, again, you take some of the colleagues that are around him. You take, uh, uh, well, take Gordon Brown uh, as a very good example, who has come through a very real experience of local government and involvement in local political experience into his major national responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you.